we are we are here um, and let me go back first uh, I will give a little overview of a quarter of an hour or so 10 minutes and then go to the discussion um, let me go back to the prehistorical times in 1965 Warburg then the giant of of oxygen evolution published this paper say dioxygen formed from bicarbonate and it took like often in science, wrong ideas are often just ignored. It takes very long un until they are disproved. So it took uh, almost 40 years that in a, in a side experiment with um, Johannes Messinger, we found out it, it's wrong. Yeah? But it was ignored for all the time. So this was the, the gray past where there was nothing known. And what we are celebrating here is not only Bertel Anderson's good decade of improving scientific quality of NTU and not only 30 years of Jim Barber assembling the flock of water oxidation men, people uh, but also 50 jubilee of a new era because after this Warburg stuff uh, a whole new story started and it had to do with other instrumentation. 67 in Witt's lab, this was uh, just when Norrish and Porter and Eigen got the Nobel Prize for rapid connections, uh, rapid reactions. Uh, they detected, uh, Günther Döring, uh, they detected that their, the sensitizer for oxygen evolution is a chlorophyll moiety called P680. And a new era started when the Jolios devised a new polarographic electrode. Before, with Warburg's uh, manometric technique, um, there was no, no way to uh, get deeper into oxygen evolution. And I give you this conversation in 65 at the Brookhaven Symposium between Witt and Warburg. Warburg uh, confronted with Witt flashing algae and so on, and looking at absorption transients. So Warburg said, how can you just from looking at these transient ever discover the chemical mechanism of uh, water oxidation? And Witt answered, if you want to understand the motor of a car, it's not enough to sniff at the exhaust. <laughs> so this machine was able to time resolve the oxygen evolution. And it was fundamental for the progress to come. So we are celebrating now 50 years, let's say, uh, of water oxidation research. Um, now, this machine was used by Bessel Koch. And the, you see the, the oscillatory pattern there. That's oxygen evolution as a function of the flash number. It's a classical experiment. And Koch concluded that oxygen is evolved by a catalyst that can store four charges. He called it charges, oxidizing equivalents. Before all, all at once, it reacts with four electrons and develops oxy dioxygen from two molecules of water. So this set the path. Of course, it took 14 years until the first purified prep of the water oxidase was available. In between was Bertel Anderson with a purification, no, a highly enrichment of photosystem too. But it was not as clear as these BBY particles, Jokums and Babcocks. Important was the function unit has 250 chlorophylls approximately, four manganeses and one component Z, which later came out to be a tyrosine. So this was uh, a condensation of the machinery. Now, from 84, when the first particles were available, up to, let's say, 1,000, there was an almost comprehensive kinetic characterization of the reactions from picoseconds into the millisecond time range. And by X-ray, UV, visible, IR, EPR, and or mass spectroscopy, all spectroscopic techniques, labs in all the 
uh, all countries <laughs> over the world. And it came out that from the manganese 4, the electrons are ex extracted into the chlorophyll P680 via a tyrosine, which exchanges protons with a nearby histidine. And then, um, already in 67, I discovered that this, this reaction crosses the membrane and electrifies it with about 50 millivolt. Um, and all these reactions were characterized from picoseconds to the millisecond time range. And the, e the ejection of proteins, for protons from the very center of oxygen evolution was characterized, and uh, Johannes Messinger characterized the, the incoming waters in this reaction sequence. Of course, uh, despite all this kinetic characterization, a structure was badly needed to interpret the data. And the first structure model came out from the Witt lab, uh, Athena Suni and others, and you see there the transmembrane helices, but the metal cluster, you know, these four manganeses, came out as a shoe, I call it a, a boot model. Uh, <laughs> okay, but then a few years later, Jim Barber with um, Zoe Vata, they came up, uh, they, const they came up with a model for the manganese calcium cluster, which had essentially survived the tide of time still today. You see at the right, this is a nomenclature obtained from much higher resolution in 2011. The three manganeses in a cubanic structure cubanoid structure with the calcium and the dangler manganese and the waters bound in the oxygens. Basically, this first model of John, uh, Jim Walk, uh, uh, <laughs> Jim Barber, <laughs> sorry, John, <laughs> sorry, John, um, uh, had survived and it served as a scaffold for all the, the following uh, activities. First, there were activities that were negative because it was known already that uh, in X-ray diffraction you have radiation damage and you reduce the manganese and it was very clearly shown in 2005 by the Berkeley Berlin group that the, uh, uh, the radiation damaged the, the manganese uh, cluster, it, it reduces it to manganese 2 and it was not trivial whether the structure of the cluster is stable to such big changes of oxidation state. But another thing came up, um, taking the Barber structure as the starting point for simulations, quantum chemical sedium uh, simulations, Pierre Siegbahn constructed a structural model in silico. He could not have done it if he had not a firm starting point. But then he iterated and found uh, energy minimized structure, which slightly differed from the published one. In this case, often computational biochemistry is not predictive. It's just descriptive, what I call post-mortem surgery. But in Pear's case, it was predictive in a, in a way saying, well, the, the distances and the angles are a little bit different. And the conclusion was also, it may be that the structure that uh, they published, Jim published, uh, had this radiation damage. This could be true. So he was predictive. It's very important to mention that another predictive aspect is that you can calculate the energy profile, energy landscapes in this cluster. Because just seeing a structure tells you nothing of the energy landscape. You have to calculate it. And then you know how the reactions will proceed. So it was very fortunate that Pear came up with these predictive kind of calculations. Then, of course, the structure was improved. 
Chen came up with a structural model at 1.9 angstrom resolution. And it corroborated the previous structure, but not in any detail. One ligand, one residue, protein residue, amino acid, was now a bidentate ligand and not monodentate. And there were some distance changes and so on. Uh, this was work with CV, CW, a continuous wave X-ray illumination, and at cryo temperatures. The Berkeley Be Be Berlin group, uh, uh, Athena, Suni, Yoko Yano, she is not here anymore, uh, Johannes, and so on, came up with femtosecond X-ray free, um, X-ray free electron laser. Um, that has the advantage that it takes the picture of diffraction picture before the destruction of the crystal. Whether this is all true, uh, let's we have it. We bring it up in the discussion part. The resolution was not very high at this time, but it was obtained at room temperature. This is very important because we have this rich kinetic behavior of this four-step reaction and then all four electron reaction at once in a millisecond and giving oxygen. The ideal for the physicist when dealing with such systems is to have a time-resolved X-ray structure and so on. And you have to do it at room temperature. So this was pioneering in, in so far as it was room temperature. And then Shen came up Shen's group with femtosecond X-ray and so on, structural model at cryo temperature, radiation damage free, 1.95 angstrom resolution. So structures uh, are fine if you want to understand the system, but they don't, don't tell you everything. So you need also models on 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 the mechanism. And there are, there are several if, um, models for the reactions that finally gives rise to oxygen, dioxygen from water. One important intermediate is of course the, the peroxide. And the, the peroxide intermediate, there are two, two, propo there are, there are two proposals. One, one by Jim Barber and the other by Pierre Siegbahn. Uh, there are more proposals, of course, but how to prove them? Uh, concepts and proposals are very important in science, yeah? And, uh, okay. Now, Pierre Siegbahn flatly said, on energetic grounds, this upper model is impossible. And uh, at a Bunty plot in London, he said, it's all done. My model is right. <laughs> so in science, hardly ever is anything done. Think of the photosynthetic re bacterial reaction center, yeah? After the Nobel Prize was granted, was it done? No, no, no. Work started from there. Okay. So when he says it's done, take it as <laughs> good humor, yeah? But it definitely, it's, it's not. Okay. Uh, is the mission accomplished? It has two, this, the answer to this question has two aspects. We have to understand the system fully, and that's science. And the other is, we have to, we have, we should, like Feynman said, yeah, there's, you don't underst really understand if you can't make, a, make it. That's the other, technology. What is needed then? What is needed would be, for full understanding, time-resolved structures. And there are very few systems in biology that are apt for such an adventure. For instance, the ATP synthase, the rotary one, time-resolved structural with a good structure. Yeah? So this is a full description. Uh, this system is is apt for compli to describe complicated chemistry 
fully because structures are available and kin kinetics are available. What we need is a combination of the two. So um, let's see what are the perspectives for further progress. That is, the ultimate goal is time-resolved structural changes in the system with femtosecond free electron lasers. One obstacle, there are several op op <laughs> uh, obstacles. One is that the structural changes by re radiation damage are really a problem. And I will call on uh, proponents to briefly discuss it. And then the amazing or stupid structural stability of the metal cluster to towards temperature changes, state shifts, valency changes, and even deletion of the manganese. The protein scaffold stays. Yeah? It's a stupidly stable system. And will it be possible to time resolve the structural changes over the four-step reaction cascade of the making of dioxygen? Will it be possible in, in, with regard to that the system is so damned stable? There, there isn't very much happening. And on the other hand, that we always have to cope with radiation damage. So there are two types of radiation damage. One, the reduction of the, the cluster, and Holger Dau worked on it very early, Junko Jano, she's not here, Johannes may comment on it, and then Brutwig's group, Ascherka, uh, um, uh, discussed it, and Camilla recently also worked on it. Would anybody <laughs> comment on the radiation damage by reduction? Yes, Johannes? Take mine. Yeah, I think uh, one needs to uh, be very careful to, to, comp to look at the re radiation damage by reduction that occurs normally at the synchrotron and what can happen at the x fell for example. Uh, so uh, radiation damage that we see uh, in normal uh, uh, it's a normal synchrotrons that, that can be avoided by using the x fell because just of time reasons. Um, then the other thing at x fell it comes to the Coulomb explosion, and there one has to be also careful, but uh, that can be completely controlled uh, by, by setting the right condition, having the right uh, photon flux. and uh, So uh, that, that we know very well and we're very careful with it, and there's actually no problem. I can maybe comment. Is this on? Comment about the Coulomb explosion. So Mohammed Amin has been working with us to do quantum calculations. The problem is it, with the XFEL is, is that you generate an enormous electric field when you apply these very short femtosecond pulses. And charged particles move in electric field. And he's calculated that movement. And it, it's, it is a problem. And it, it, it's, you cannot ignore it, even in the XFEL experiments. And it, it, um, it depends on the length of the pulse. Some of the pulses are longer. I think the Japanese pulses are about 10 femtoseconds, but the uh, Stanford ones are more like 50 femtoseconds. What are the time constraints? And the time scale for this is, for movement, is on that time scale of 50 femtoseconds. Um, and it's more significant when you're in a higher oxidation state because the charges are higher. Um, at the current resolution, it's probably not a problem. But if you want to push the resolution higher, it's something you need to think about. And what Mohammed pointed out is that you really need to use 10 femtosecond X-ray pulses to really be able to be sure it's not going to be a problem for the structure. Yeah. May I respond to that? So it's, it's actually not so much the, if it's 10 femtosecond or 50 femtoseconds. So we have actually measured on both in Japan and in uh, Stanford with both things, and we get exactly the same data at two angstrom resolution. Um, so that is not the problem, and that can be also understood because it's uh, the photon flux uh, per area that you have that is important. Yeah, yeah. So how many times the manganese ion is being ionized? And if that is a very low percentage uh, that that can happen, then it doesn't play a big role. And I also like to point out is that we simultaneously measure the, the XAS. So it's not separate measurements, but 
for all the data that we report nowadays, it's measured at the same time, the same crystals for diffraction as for the XAS. So we have exquisite control of the turnover, and if there were a problem, we could see that in the XAS. But, you know, the XAS is not even the issue. It's the movement of the atoms within the oxygen evolving complex during this very strong electric field. Of course, it does depend on the intensity of the electric field yeah. as well as the time. So weaker electric fields will play a role. But the oxygens tend to be moving more because they're lighter. And, and that motion is, is not something you can ignore, if you, especially if you're trying to get high resolution structures. No, I, I think it's under control completely. Yeah, I, I should uh, comment on the radiation damage. I, Prefer like Jim to say that. Now, hmm. it, it's exaggerated the, the radiation damage because it affects the distances and so. What is, for my purpose, it doesn't really matter much. But for what matters is much more is the resolution. So that's why I discovered another oxygen, because the resolution was not good enough. And I think the same thing now with X-field structure is that um, the, the resolution was not good enough, so they missed the one hydroxide. But uh, radiation damage causes, can in some cases cause big changes, but it didn't. I, I put the, my correct structure into the density of Jim structure and it fits perfectly so it's no no big deal right. uh, yeah what I would also like to make a comment on this and uh, we I'm glad you you mentioned our structure we solved the first high resolution structure in 2011 at 1.9 strong and uh, we then solved the radiation damage free structure in Actually, it's 2.15 by XFEL uh, at 1.95 Anstrom. And based on the comparison between these two structures, we did see some differences in the distances of some uh, magnets, magnets, and magnets oxygen distances. But I completely agree with Per Sigbang that uh, it also depends on the resolution of the structure. So we are fighting against the resolution. And we have always said we have experimental errors at this level of resolution. So uh, we think that the radiation damage is very, not very important for the case of PS2 uh, at the current resolution and also for the mechanism. And what is important is really you said that we need a time resolved uh, structure. And the first one we reported actually is 2012, uh, 15, uh, last year, 17. And we solved the structure of S3 state by two flashes. And we did see structure changes and the insertion of new oxygen atom into the cluster. And uh, what, is, what I would also like to mention is, is that just before, or a few months before our paper was published in Nature in last year, the Berkeley Group published a paper, a very similar paper, but they did not say, they did not say any changes. But now you see from the talk of Jun Koyano in the first day, they changed their results and they changed their mind. They also see uh, the O6 oxygen insertion in a three state. So we think we are coming to the same conclusion that there is a new oxygen, new water molecule inserted in the S3 state uh, close to O5, and they may form the O bond, which is very similar to the mechanism, mechanism of per bond proposed. Okay. Yes, Johannes? Yeah, I completely agree, and just like to add to that, that we actually, Junko mentioned that also, that actually can time resolve between S2 and S3, so we can measure time points bet between two and S2 and S3 and follow the reaction uh, how it's going on, how the water is being inserted, at what time point, and so forth. So I think it's really getting down to the basics and what we really want to know with this technique. So it's extremely powerful. Um, yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you turn the uh, uh, PPT slide to the two possible mechanism you showed now? That, that, PP, that uh, page? Sorry, uh, please. The 
to that page, the two structure, the two pos pos uh, yeah, this one, exactly, thank you. Uh, if we look at these two structures for three seconds, yeah, we, we will see that something missing is the dangling magnets. If you see the left side, we ignore two oxygen atoms. And now I think in most of the drawing in the literature or proposals, uh, we draw it like uh, uh, water or hydroxyl groups. But uh, for me, maybe it's just a question. I won't get the answer. Uh, we, start <coughs> we take the ruthenium complex coordinates complex as an uh, example. If you oxidize ruthenium from ruthenium 2 to ruthenium 3, <coughs> then to ruthenium 4, if you got ruthenium 4 even at very acid condition, you cannot stay a water on it. It must be a oxo. Here, it's already be magnesium 5 oxo. If you put a water on it, I don't believe it, the proton can be stayed on the oxygen atom. I, 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 yeah. I mean, with neut neutron yeah. diffraction, <laughs> it can be seen, yeah. Uh, uh, Jim, yeah. Well, well, I'm going to say it's almost the end point, but <coughs> this uh, reaction involves essentially three uh, species, uh, H2O, OH, and O. The difference between those three is either, uh, between two, uh, is either one or two protons. So if, if there's no dramatic uh, change in the overall structure, then we're down to looking at something that is at, uh, we could only detect at less than an angstrom, yes. a proton. So that's all we're looking at, yes. two protons, mass changes of two. And of course, water is also the solvent as well as the substrate. So, it, so the task may be enormous. I think as we go through with XFAL, we may be able to eliminate perhaps some other possibilities where large changes are expected to occur, large structural changes. But then you have to be careful too, because as you build up charge in this, in this uh, uh, complex, you will inevitably get movements of uh, components because of the overall oxidation state and, uh, of, of the system. So one has to be very careful. But the problem is that as we, if it would say that number one, uh, number A mechanism there, you would, you would have to be at the level of detection of protons to, to prove it. Uh, Just a moment. There's, uh, there's one example um, of uh, 0.7 angstrom resolution. Titus, uh, 25 years ago, Krembin, 8 kilodalton protein. Yeah? <laughs> that also yes. Yeah, but it has to be small. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Exactly. I just uh, like to respond directly to Jim. Uh, so it's not that we really need to see the protons to see if there is a change happening, because if, if that would happen, like a manganese 5 oxo formation, there would be a distance change between manganese and oxygen. There would be ligands reacting to that change. So there are, there are many ways to see changes in these uh, things, even if you can't see the proton. So I don't think it's really... Well, it, yeah, I agree. Uh, you totally agree. But those were the indirect, and you can actually see the reaction, black and white. You no, I, I think we can... I mean, that, that is a direct... If, if something happens on one side, and, and we can see even waters maybe moving there or, or missing or something like that, I mean, that would give really a direct uh, evidence yeah. where the reaction takes maybe, place and how it takes place. Maybe, so I'm quite optimistic, really. Okay. Yeah, yeah no, it's, a, it's a bit along the same line. I, I think uh, we were discussing radiation damage, and I, my opinion indeed is that the XFEL at the current stage has solved this problem. Uh, it's undoubtedly the, 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 it's the standard X-ray irradiation. It may have had, has served a lot or has done very well in solving the resting state structure of a manganese complex where the radiation damage did not cause dramatic modifications, but it would have been impossible to study higher oxidation states with that method. And to go to higher oxidation states, the XFEL method seems to work reasonably well, although there's no, no indications for radiation damage. So I think it's right now the method of choice. And of course, I think that it's the 
the hope for the future indeed to get time-resolved experiments with this method. But I also agree that uh, with Jim in a way that we, we, we need to see more of, about the protons in a way. A neutron diffraction structure, a lot of people are trying that, but it's, uh, it's, in the sky. it's unclear. It's in the it's sky, yeah. yeah. So therefore, we, we are trying to... For our grandchildren. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not so... I'm not <laughs> that pes pessimistic. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think uh, one way to go in the meantime is indeed infrared spectroscopy. It's an enormous task, but it, it's, it's more easily to, to do time-resolved in a time-resolved way. Therefore, I think that's, that's one way to go. And then, of course, we need, still need to continue the uh, phase with the computational studies because we, the transition state we will never see. <laughs> we want to see everything, but we will never Short see it. And shortly. it's short-lived. There's no chance. There are also <laughs> kinetic limitations. Yes. And there's another option, which is a problem or uh, another thing to consider, which is a problem, especially for computational chemistry, is that the reaction itself might, may start in a rare state not in a transition state, which is yeah, yeah, yeah. but also in a rare configuration of the water molecules. And at that point, we also need a kind of an going ahead with the computational methods uh, to tackle uh, longer time domains, but also to address the possibility of having a reaction started in a rare state. Now, yes, there, are, there are two opinions here. One is give up. <laughs> James, no. <laughs> No, no, wait, wait, wait. Uh, no, no, let me interpret you. <laughs> uh, stop, because we won't be able to see the protons, and these are important for the intermediate states. That's important. The other is, uh, and, and the same, on the same line, this system is so damned stupidly stable, yeah, that the conformational changes will be very low. And then we have... Um, we have other opinions of experimenters who surely will try to time resolve it. Yes, Johannes? Yeah, I, I agree with what uh, Holger said. I just, he said it would be uh, something for the future to do the time resolved experiments. I just want to emphasize it's going on. Yeah. I mean, right. we have shown the data from S2 to S3. We have also preliminary data going from S3 to S0. You have seen the good resolution for S3 and S0. I mean, there's nothing that stops us. I meant us the, the near it's future. Room it's room it's, temperature. It's all room temperature. So, yes. I mean, it's ongoing. It's not something that will be happening in 10 years. But yes. probably within a year or so, we have good structures. Yes. OK. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we get intermediates like S3 tiles in the radical, and, and then we can probe other times. We have the XAS data to go to the right, see what the profile is, to go to the right time points, and to st study it. I just like, you know, I, I agree with what Holger said, and I, but I'd like to point out that, you know, the rate limiting step to go from S3 to S4 is electron transfer. And all these intermediates we're talking about happen after the rate, that rate determining step. So you, by kinetics, they decay faster than they form, so you cannot see them as an intermediate. And so no matter how fast your time resolution is, you're not going to get it fast enough to see it as something that doesn't exist for any time. Um, and so I think this is a big challenge for the future to uh, perhaps come up with modifications that can change the rate determining step. And I also want to point out that we see a reasonably big change in the structure going from S2 to S3. And that happens on a microsecond time scale. Um, and we have a, over a millisecond in the S3 to S0 change. I think Holger's point about rare structures, there's a lot of time for structure changes to happen. And that's something we need to think about, too. One last Uh, yes, for PS2, it's difficult, and the, we have many problems, yeah. and it's very hard to get very exact structure, also the dynamics, but for the artificial model complex, that could become much, much easier. I hope the community can see <coughs> the artificial model complex. Now we are working be because we, we actually we already trapped the manganese artificial model complex with oxygen, with oxygen, but uh, only, the only problem we didn't get the, the structure, a good structure for that, because that artificial model can release oxygen, can uh, release oxygen very efficiently. Now we are talking with, I hope, but, but when I, I personally, I need the, the, the help from the community. So probably 
if we can use the artificial model complex, we probably we can get more clearly information for how to form the old bond and what's going on in the structure <coughs> change. So this is my comment. Thank you. My last comment is no, that the microphone. diagram, um, I drew it. It's for me, yes. this diagram. Yes. And I, I, feel a, I feel slightly ashamed of it, I think in that the radical attack within the cube uh, shouldn't be, as I've shown it there, as if it's one of the oxos of the, of the cube itself, because the, the, sig, the sig burn mechanism involves the insertion of a substrate water molecule between S2 and S3, and, they, and, and you need, I, would, I should have put another bond in there with, the ox, uh, with a different oxygen, not, not the oxygen in the corner. So that's not a fair representation of the sig burn mechanism um, um, and, but I did send it to Pear at the time. He said, well, it's good enough. Um, <laughs> but it, it's not a really a fair representation. My mistake. My mistake. But anyway, the idea is, uh, the roughly the idea is there. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jim. Oh, sorry, and no. let's thank all the discussants. <laughs>